everyone again for coming. This is uh, one of our monthly workshops. Today's topic is, as advertised, uh, some advice about working with federal sponsors, how you find them, how you develop relationships with them, things that work for them, uh, and things that don't work for them, which is, that's the important side of this, is uh, how not to be afraid of your federal sponsors. They're there to help you, uh, but how not to make yourself a nuisance, and how to learn to communicate with them, uh, to demonstrate that you can add value to what they're trying to accomplish. You know, one of the fundamentals in grantsmanship is understanding that your, the sponsors owe you nothing. They've been, uh, they are stewards of funding that's made available to accomplish goals. And their job is to accomplish those goals, not to fund you. Uh, and that's a, a big part of your, your thinking and your, your mentality when approaching or pursuing federal sponsors. Uh, like all of our panel workshops, uh, the intention is to find uh, some people in our community who have some deep experience and success in the topic. Uh, the two folks with us today, Dr. Song Choi from Agriculture and Dr. Greg Rushton from the Tennessee, Tennessee Center for STEM Education, both have our both are experts in their field. They both have national standing. They're the kind of people who program officers know by name. Uh, they seek them out at conferences, etc. They're at different places in their career. Dr. Rushton doesn't like me to remind him that he's 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 on the he's he's starting to leave mid-career in the rearview mirror, uh, which I think he should be proud of. But apparently, he's sensitive about that. And um, Dr. Choi is early career. He's only a few years ahead of uh, all of our early uh, faculty. But they both have they have similar trajectories in terms of their intrinsic motivation and their capabilities uh, and the things they've learned along the way. Um, they're both perennially funded with federal funds. We're so pleased to have them here. I'm going to excuse myself, uh, go back to my desk and be angry, which is just, <laughs> Dr. Rushton knows that's one of the things I do in my office, and um, leave you with them. And uh, Casey Penston is here from my office. She's fairly new. She's a program assistant to help with things just like that. So uh, hopefully this is going to be informal once they get going through their slides and encourage you to just have an open and relaxed conversation with these two gentlemen. And thank you for coming. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. I don't know who wants to come. I don't know how they older this. I don't know. Is it? Yeah. This slide is your, your first. Oh, it's not I go first? No, oh, okay. Uh, all right. Can you all hear me? All right, all right. Thank you for coming. Uh, like the uh, uh, Mr. Porter was saying, uh, my name is Song Choi. So I was uh, uh, I was hired by MTSU about seven years ago in 2013. Uh, my uh, I'm currently in the School of Agriculture. Uh, we used to call ourselves at the School of Agribusiness and Agri-Sciences. We changed the name. Uh, so uh, my uh, background is. Uh, yeah, we're gonna try to make this informal, isn't it? So uh, the informal way of defining myself is I'm a I'm a 50% of grass nerd and 50% of a computer geek. Uh, so grass nerd. Yeah, grass nerd. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, my uh, my PhD research primarily was working with forages, right? So the the, the plants that we use for feeding animals. Uh, uh, so essentially, uh, that's what I've been working with. I can identify the majority of the grasses on your property uh, growing on the pastures. So you don't need apps. <laughs> Give me a call, send me a photo. I, I'll, I'll pinch that down for you, what kind of species it is. Uh, so uh, uh, on the side, of when I was in grad school, I also pursued a degree in uh, uh, computer sciences. So I work with machine learning, uh, data sciences. So uh, I kind of put myself in a very odd combination of skills. And I thought, you know, uh, that makes me, professionally speaking, I'm an outlier. <laughs> I went to American Society of Agronomy conferences. I, I like talking about data sciences, and I went to data sciences. Sciences conference, I like to talk about agriculture, you know. <laughs> so uh, anyway, it turned out it works out very well when I was working with the uh, the, the the granting agencies. When I'm uh, submitting grant proposals, you know, coming up some things that really help me to see both sides of the story, so I can put up things very efficiently. Uh, that's what I've been trying to do. Uh, I think, in my opinion, MTSU is perhaps one of the, uh, in my opinion, one of the best uh, places for doing this kind of work because they really give you flexibility. You can really be more, you know, leading towards a teaching-oriented factor members or you can be leaning towards a research oriented uh, faculty member so uh, to me I gain uh, excitement from both so uh, that's why I, I really enjoy that kind of a balance right here uh, 
All right, so about uh, grant proposal writing. So those are the do's uh, and the, uh, it's been a while since I put up those things together. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think there's, a, I just wanna share you some of the things I think is very important. Uh, when I was hired in 2013, I, uh, our chair was, the, by that time, was Dr. Warren Gill, and he's, uh, uh, he used to be, uh, uh, he used to work for University of Tennessee, so he's very used to the land grant systems. Uh, he, the first thing, uh, there are two things that make, make making my, my first year's job really, really busy. I shouldn't say that stressful, but I think it's very, I'm very productive uh, because his, his office is right across the hallway from my office. <laughs> we try to beat each other on an early morning. He arrived at 7 o'clock, I try to arrive at 6.30. So. <laughs> and he, the first thing he was telling me, you know, uh, you need to get yourself established, you need to get, get your food on the ground, you need to get some research uh, project going. And it's, it is very challenging, uh, we all know that, but he said that, you know, you, the first thing you need to do is just keep, keep on submitting. So uh, uh, I think the first two years I submitted about 13, 13 to 15 proposals. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed it actually. <laughs> you know, coming up with ideas and putting, uh, the, the, of course there are some smaller ones, small, some larger ones. Uh, you just keep on submitting. So uh, what would be the best advice I can give to some people who's getting into this, 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 this whole room is really uh, you gotta keep on submitting, uh, otherwise you would not get it, right? That's, that's just the, uh, the, the simple rule. Uh, and after I, I'll be able to land it on some of the, uh, the fairly competitive uh, large scale grants. I believe the first one I was landing on was about 300,000. It was multi-institutional collaborative work, uh, involves three institutions. And then the second one, I, I did a better job because that one's more competitive. Uh, so uh, at that time, uh, I believe USDA NIFA, which is primarily the institution funding my research, stands for United States Agriculture, uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, NIFA stands for National Institute of Food and Agriculture. So, so there's a, uh, the USDA is a whole umbrella. They have like 30 or something different institutions spreading out. They have USDA, NIFA, NRCS, ARS. They have different, uh, the NIFA was primarily the one giving you those federal grants uh, for supporting your research. So they, uh, after I got the first competitive one uh, funded, they actually put my name in the database. So I got recruited later uh, by those program directors. They said, hey, we got this new programs going on. Would you be interested in being a reviewer? So they said, yes. So through that process, actually learning more about how to better write grants proposals and how that process works out. So that's why I can share you some of the insights, maybe from both sides of the story. Uh, so the thing is, for, I, I, I can only speak for NIFA because I, I primarily that's where my, my grants was coming from. Uh, Dr. Rashton, you got enriched experience from NIH, uh, National Science Foundation, which I, I cannot speak out of that. Uh, but for NIFA, uh, essentially, uh, you need to grab the reviewers. They think got a later point, right? Is that working? I don't think it's working. Anyway, so you need to grab the reviewer's attention uh, in about five minutes. Uh, so the way that works out is, uh Every year, uh, when their NIFA announced their all of their uh, competitive programs, you know, on their uh, website, it was NIFA. You can do a grant, uh, NIFA grant search. Uh, after they got all the proposals uh, received, and what they will do, they will come up with the panel. So they will invite a lot of people from different institutions, different background. Uh, we all will convene at uh, Washington D.C. Uh, I used to be Washington D.C., and right now they moved their headquarters to, uh, I believe, Kansas, uh, state of Kansas, right? So Kansas City. Uh, so. So uh, the way that works out is really uh, you know, each individual person has to, they will be assigned to about seven to eight proposals uh, to read it. Uh, everyone was talking about, you know, you, you be careful with your proposal, you have to attract the reviewer's attention uh, within five minutes, which is partially true. You know, uh, the first thing we, we do is really, we go over the abstract and we, we want to see what's the, what's the general story behind those proposals, what they want to do. Uh, that's perhaps the initial five minutes. And then each one of the reviewers spend about, they encourage you to spend about five to seven seven hours per proposal. So you're gonna have to read it very carefully. <laughs> I'm not sure about National Science Foundation. It's probably, that's a lot. Uh, so to uh, be honest with you, I spent about three hours, okay? Three, three and three hours and a half. Uh, so yeah, the, you, you have to come up with a very good idea. Uh, you have to uh, make your, oh, I see this pointer. It's not, it's not working on a screen. Oh, okay. Thank you see that? It works on a wall. So it's not, it's not showing up on a screen. So you have to formulate a memorable hook. So uh, uh, a lot of the proposals submitted to NIFA, they are all in, uh, particularly some very competitive programs are very high in quality. It's very multidisciplinary. It's well, very well crafted. So uh, essentially, you, you are just, you know, all the applicants are competing with each other. 
together. So how can you uh, really put your proposal, you know, into the outstanding category? It's really, uh, it's, it's really tricky. So the way I would like to word it as you have to uh, make your proposal to formulate a memorable hook. And the, the best analogy I can come up with will be, uh, we are so close to Nashville, right? I'm a anyway, country music fan here. <laughs> my, my, my mother is a piano teacher, so I, I like classical. I'm more become a semi-country person. So, uh, you know, there's some new, new songs coming out from like Blake Shelton, you know, there's some of the good, good songs come out. You just turn on the radio and when you hear the song, it's like the song's getting into your brain. You know, it's like they're really just getting in there and coming back and forth again and again and again. And that's what I was mentioning about this memorable hook, is really you grab the, uh, the reviewer's attention. Uh, it, is a, it is a beautiful story, but you have to grab their attention very quickly, and they want to come back and rethink about your proposal all the time. So uh, uh, again, how do you formulate that good hook? That could be a, a very nicely formulated research projects. Uh, I've seen the proposal, actually, their research components are fairly, fairly weak. However, they, they have a very beautiful outreach components in that. So there are some of the things that has to grab the reviewer's attention, that has to make you, you, your proposal stand out. Uh, with that being said, if you have a proposal like that, you will start seeing that each proposal typically will have three individual reviewers looking at it very closely. So those are the primary, secondary, and tertiary. So when you impress them a lot, they will, they will try to fight it for you. So that's at least I, I've seen some of those I really like. So and then after the review, each one of the proposal, proposal everyone will form a panel. So we're going to discuss each one of those. So if your proposal is really standing out, uh, all, all of them are going to be really fighting hard for you. So they're trying to push your proposal standing from that normal distribution curve all the way to the top, top ranking category. So that would dramatically increase the chance of being funded. Uh, the rule of thumb from USDA and NIFA, you need to have at least two excellence, uh, at least two excellence in order to jump into the high priority. So that way you can be, uh, eventually you can be funded. Uh, I know that sounds vague, but it's really, uh, it's really what it is. I'll keep it fresh and noble. Uh, I mean, the, the old music, old songs are, are good, but you always try to publish some new albums every year, try to grab the reviewer's attention, so you have to be cutting edge, you're making sure you are conducting research, uh, conducting excellent educational research, or whatever could that be, uh, so you're making sure you're on a, kind of, uh, on a cutting edge. At least from a USJ and NIFA standpoint, we do, when we are reviewing proposals, we do look at the PI experiences. So we look at the CVs, we look at the bio sketch, looking at how many papers, <laughs> not really how many, not in terms of numbers, but also the quality. We look at how productive you are, are, uh, your credential that really matters. Uh, I spent time reading the RFA. Uh, that's really a, a lot of people fail to do that very well. Uh, I've seen a lot of people submitting proposals not according to the guidelines, so they don't follow the correct format. Th those are really you know wasting a lot of time and energy. Uh, so those are some of the uh, the do list. Uh, some of the don't uh, do not go solo. Uh, I've had some success with going solo if I'm applying for small industrial type grants, like to say somebody wants to work with bio you know bio uh, bio biofuel project or green algae. Small plus research, we can do with that. But for large federal supported grants, it's better to go multidisciplinary and making sure you have a very diverse background in your in your uh, project management team. Uh, don't extrapolate too far. And I've seen proposals, they try to uh, uh, come up with like 18 pages of proposal and try to answer everything that's happening in agriculture industry. It's not going to happen, right? So we have to make sure you are focusing on something. Uh, and don't forget about cohesion. Uh, again, that's the goal on the other end of the spectrum. I've seen a very beautiful set of multidisciplinary teams. Uh, everyone is doing very excellent work in their own discipline, have their own methodology, uh, have their own novel ways of understanding data. And then when they put up things together, they just don't come up with it very well. So they always lack that cohesiveness in their proposal. So that's why the USD and NIFA has been focusing on, hey, you'd better include a chapter called uh, the data management plan or either data synthesis plan. So how are you going to be able to do, you know, you got all this data coming in, how you may be able to put them all together. So that's become more and more important. Uh, don't procrastinate. Uh, I put that over here, uh, even though I, I'm the one that procrastinate a lot, I can tell them that. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, it's really, you better jump on that early, uh, making sure you have like some of the programs in your mind that you are preparing for it. So typically what's happened, the same program, they probably will announce it next year. So you know the time window when the RFA uh, stands for Request for Application will be announced. So it better be better prepared for this. And by the time the RFA is ready, you better have your team ready so you can jump on your proposal as soon as possible. Uh, 
So those are the don'ts. Uh, interact with the national program leaders. Uh, from my personal experiences, I like to attend uh, uh, professional conferences. Uh, as a matter of fact, I should apologize that, that we reschedule this conference many times because I have a lot of professional conferences I have to go. Uh, so sorry for that. Uh, so the, the good thing about going to this professional conference, you got an opportunity not only interacting with your peers, but also you are interacting with people from, uh, from NIFA. So uh, they will be there all the time. They are looking at your posters, at your presentations, and making sure you acknowledge their names <laughs> in the very end. Uh, at the same time, they, will, uh, they would like to talk to you. Uh, the, uh, the, the thing that I like to know the most is really I want to interact with the program director on an individual basis. You know, I, I was telling them, you know what, I, got, I published this paper, I did my presentation posters, how can I better acknowledge you know, the, the contribution of your project? And they, uh, they typically they will tell me, hey, why don't you send, a, send an email to the, uh, to, the, to the NIFA director and brag about how good this program is. When you meet them in the conference, go ahead and shake their hands and telling them this, this program really helped you and also your institution and also the students and helped them advance a lot. So uh, that's really some of the good advices uh, that I, I learned uh, on the way. Uh, express your willingness to serve as a review, on a reviewer's panel. Uh, you typically want to prepare your business cards and when you see the, the, the USDA directors, and go ahead, go ahead and send them their name, uh, business card and telling them, you know, I, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, recruiting is actually a big effort from an NIFA standpoint. They, uh, they sometimes just have a lot of challenge. The reason being, there are only going to be so many people rise all the way to the top of their discipline and they don't want to send them the invitation emails on a yearly basis. So they do want a new people to, to come in and join and help their, uh, help their work. Uh, deliver the uh, excellent project outcomes. Uh, NIFA will typically hold their project director meeting every one or two years. So they will ask you to come over and give a presentation uh, to talk about what you're doing. And that will typically be the best time to uh, impress them a lot. Okay? Uh, you you want to make sure you do a good job, but you, you actually have to do an excellent job on that. So spend a lot of time on preparing for this presentation. Uh, do not hesitate to write an email to the director, as I mentioned. Uh, if I got any personal questions, I can email them. I really do. They really respond, uh, respond my email very quickly. Uh, so those are the the things that I can think of. Oh, those are the don'ts, yeah. Don't turn down invitations. So anytime you got an email from a, uh, from a professor, like you're asking, hey, are you available? Are you willing to serve? And just say that, yeah, yes, I'm, I'm happy. The, the experience on that, I was originally, I think it was the second year when I was hired at MTSU, I was invited to serve on a, a, a program reviewer board from uh, University of Nebraska, Lincoln. So they have this uh, consortium of uh, grant collaboration projects. It's actually internal, but I serve on the, on the, uh, the reviewer's uh, panel. So they realized, well, he's pretty good. Let's go ahead and recommend him to NIFA. So that's some of the people getting getting to uh, getting to know me a little bit better. So uh, just get your name out there. Uh, don't send complaint emails about comments received from the reviewers panel. Uh, just call them. Uh, so the, uh, for your proposal, if you look at your proposal submitted to NIFA, when the reviewer's comments come back, you don't see any something called a synthesis comments. That means your proposal has been triaged. So it's not, it's not a good proposal. They don't even go enter a second phase. Uh, so if you do see the synthesis comments from the panel, that means your proposal is pretty good. So any kind of a negative comments coming out of it is actually was trying to help you to do a better job next time. So don't hold any comments personally. I say, I don't think that reviewer likes me. I think he has a strong bias also and then one thing on the other. Just try to be professional. Uh, if you are something, you say, ah, well, you know what, it's very obvious. I have this components in the proposal. How come they brought it up? I, don't have, I didn't include it. I did. Uh, you can just call the program director. They'll be happy to, to answer any kind of questions for you. Uh, even the, the worst case scenario, they might come back, you know what, uh, the funds are already gone. Cannot do anything. But at least you'll give a good impression on program director. And they will, they will try to help you in the next year. So you know, hey, the program's going to be announced. They will tell you they might, you might have a better chance of getting it. Uh, yeah, and don't, don't hesitate to call them if a sub or E is not performing. Uh, I've personally experienced that before. There's one of the good, pro, uh, uh, the first grant proposal I got funded. Uh, one of my sub or E collaboration institutions, they are now performing. So essentially, they are doing what they are doing before. They don't want to do anything extra uh, to, uh, to fulfill their service. Uh, at that stage of the game, I, I have to call the, the director. And they totally understand it. So they're involved in management. So if you think things, things happen, it's not happening towards the way you want to see that, uh, go ahead and give them a call. Uh, so yeah, with that being said, uh, yeah, grant writing is hard, the uh, time consuming, you know, it uh, requires a lot of commitment. Uh, but from my own uh, experiences, and I think it's very rewarding, you know, especially when the moment you got an email saying, uh, congratulations, you know, I got a phone call from USDA NIFA, and this is a very rewarding process, and uh, you can do a, lo a lot of things, so with additional funding research, right? So it's, 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 it's important for getting the ball rolling, yeah. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, awesome.
say a couple more things and then we'll hopefully have a good conversation. I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna, sit, I'm gonna sit here. Do I need to use this? I, I don't. It is connected to the Okay. Brains. Can you guys hear me okay? I'm not using my, my loud teaching voice. Okay, so just a little bit about me. What did I write? We were supposed to do this in like December, I think, right? Or November? Okay. Um, so um, I started my career at a university like this um, in Atlanta. And so I feel like I can speak a little bit from the perspective of someone that's entering their career in a teaching center, teaching focused institution that's trying to move to become more uh, research active and the challenges that are associated with that. So our university, I think similar to MTSU, lacks a strong research infrastructure. Um, just to think about like having a, a session like this and having like eight people at it tells, and we hire like 80 or 90 people a year, <laughs> tells me that like we lack a research infrastructure. Like I would go to every one of these things as a new faculty member because um, it's like Song was saying, it's super hard. And especially in a uh, situation like this where most of our conversations in most of our faculty meetings and with our colleagues is about teaching and curriculum and scheduling and students and all that. And uh, like it feels like it's more rare to have these kinds of conversations. So um, I didn't feel like I had strong role models. I felt like most of my faculty were looking to me to be the like expert when I was just coming out of grad school. Um, so I started writing, I started as a faculty member in 2004. I, I did my uh, PhD in physical organic chemistry and I had taught high school science, uh, chemistry and physics and, and math. And, and uh, so I just started writing proposals because everyone, my chair basically said the same thing. Oh, you need to start a research you know, program, take students and write proposals and be published. As if like that's like all you have to do is say it and then like <laughs> it happens. Um, so so I started writing proposals and um, my f my first nine were uh, declined. So for my first three years, I wrote like multiple proposals every year and the the easy ones, the short ones, the low amount of dollars, the the high risk ones. Like every every single thing was was rejected. Um, I remember in my I think my second year there was some state funding and I got the rejection letter and it said oh Dr. Russian we're so sorry um, to have to write this to you we were only able to fund 70% of the proposals <laughs> in the state uh, and I'm like oh wow okay so I'm in the bottom 30% of the people in Georgia okay um, so uh, it just made me like it like it it really made me think like, should I go back and teach high school? Like, um, I didn't feel like I was in the lower 30% of the high school teachers in, in my district. Um, it was just a really unsettling thing. And, and for faculty that aren't engaged in that kind of work, you don't, I didn't know how to interpret those experiences except that, I, except to assume, conclude that I was a failure, that I really should just focus on teaching because that's the only thing that I've, that maybe I'm even remotely good at. Um, so I would say that like it's as much cognitive as Song, as Song was saying as it is psychological and emotional uh, of like a process. And I know we're talking specifically about working with federal agencies and I'll say a couple things about that, but just the whole research process, um, you know, being, having to be ri really risk tolerant um, in a really difficult kind of uh, environment, I think is an important conversation to have. So since then, um, I've had, you know, much more success. Um, with federal and private agencies and state agencies and so on. Um, so that's good. Um, so uh, so here's some. Jeff asked us both to do do's and don'ts. So here are my here are my f some do's. Um, I, I I feel like. I did what Song said to start with, which is read the RFA and then write a proposal, send it, get it rejected, re repeat. Um, you know, uh, get my my friends to read it and say, "Oh, this is really good. There's no way this is not going to get funded." Keep doing that. Um, but what I realized was that 
like the way that I was reading my proposal and the way that I in, I anticipated other people re, like reading my work is is different than they actually were reading it. And I wouldn't know that until I actually called the sponsor, talked to the program officers, got myself on review panels, and then listened to the conversations. I could not believe what people would say about the same proposal that I was reading. And it made me think like, have you ever, you've had, we have a lot of students that are like, wow, Dr. Rushton is like the best chemistry professor I've ever had. And the same, like in the same class right next to me, like Dr. Rushton is like absolutely the worst chemistry professor I've ever had. How, how does he even have a job doing anything? So like two people have the same exact experience, at least from my perspective, and like have totally different interpretations. And um, it wasn't until like I listened to other people on a review panel how they would like frame and position the arguments and what like really bugged them and what stood out to them and you know like this sounds like a Blake Shelton song and it just stays in my head and I'm like I forgot it like 10 seconds after I read it you know mm -hmm. I, I don't even know I don't even know what it's about so I think like learning to like position your research in a way that's like appealing to a broad audience is really like it's a it's like a a skill in itself um so that's like one big thing i think we could take away from this conversation i'd also say that that um as much as we are would like to think of ourselves as experts and we would we would like um others people to see, see us that way that when you're new to something you don't know what you don't know and you also don't know um how to do things that that are necessary to be successful. So uh, I agree with Song that early in your career, you should try to find the senior researchers and, that are in your field, that are established, that already like will like have a better chance just going in the door because they know so much more and they have the experience uh, and join them. And, and you just learn so much from that process. The hard part is like, building the courage up to like to, to have that conversation and then also like Jeff said at the beginning like what is the value that you add to them like hey I know you have like a hundred collaborators and you have a lot of like stuff going on and you don't know me from Adam and you don't know where Middle Tennessee is or have ever heard of it but I want to work with you like how do you like add value in that conversation and uh, so we can talk about that if you want um, some ideas so um, ways that you can do that you can serve on an external advisory boards for things. Um, Song seems to have had some experience with that with, with UNL, Nebraska. Um, and on collaborative proposals, like a lot of large research projects need like test sites and we, you can be a test site, you can get a small sub award and then you can get involved in the conversation. And then also as an internal reviewer. So you don't have to necessarily serve on an external review board. You can say to the to the um, experienced person, hey, I'd like to read your proposal before you send it out. Um, I'm happy to give you any feedback. Everyone likes everyone likes someone else to read their paper and say, like, it's 99% good and I found a couple things that might be helpful. Like, that's a way to stroke someone's ego and add value and say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in yourself. Uh, so, in my field, like the way to like get stature is to get National Science Foundation funding. Uh, so, those programs tend to be super competitive and don't ever fund people. It feels like um, so. I would not only apply for those. So, if there's if there's low hanging fruit in your field, like I would identify that first and build some confidence and get a track record, get some publications, get some students. I would every semester here or whenever you can apply for that hack uh, whatever you say it here like the, the, uh, the that program that hopefully your office will come up with a better acronym for because it's like sounds like a Klingon to me um, and apply it for Eureka like every semester like that's just on your to-do list like apply for internal funding uh, I've gotten to know Jeff and his staff like they're trying to grow research here and new faculty and uh, less like less active faculty are their target audience so like everyone or most everyone in this room are the people
people they want to get proposals from. And um, like Song was saying, like there's going to review panels set up and they're going to give you substantive feedback and it's relatively low hanging fruit. And to get some of our research started, like doing it internally is a good place to start. And then you can actually write that into a grant proposal. Hey, I've gotten some external, I, you don't have to say internal funding. I have some seed funding and this is what I've done with it. Um, so yeah, don't expect immediate success or, you know, I, I, I guess I would never just expect success, um, not even immediate. And don't do it without mentoring. Um, don't avoid developing uh, contacts with sponsors. I agree with Song that like, part of the reason why I go to professional meetings is to try to find out where the federal sponsors are going to be and then like, right before the session or right after the session like I'm like hey where are you going I'll walk with you to your next thing and then I talk to them hey like what what are you looking for in this I was thinking about this idea do you need any help on a review panel um, I'm new to this field I have a PhD in organic chemistry and I want to do educational research like is there someone at this conference you think I should talk to like they love like smart experienced people like being asked questions of, that they know the answer to because they feel like hey I'm helping someone so like I would just position myself as like oh I'm the learner will you help me learn and uh, they're like yeah you don't know anything here this is what you do and then you get an email hey yeah you can serve on a review panel and then you're like hey do you have a couple minutes like before we go to lunch I want to talk to you about this idea that I have and it, whoop, I got this uh, one pager um, I just you know I had it in my bag um, so and then yeah don't have your friends read your proposals right that's who we want to send it to you know Ron should we read this you know is it good enough you're like telling them you need to like you need need to say this is good enough because like you're my friend and that's what you do but you really like the, the real friend is like send it to me the like director that's supposed to like be mean and authoritative because that's the kind of feedback that most of us don't get because all of us want to be perceived well by our colleagues so and then I mean I think like this is just true like as an academic I was just having a conversation before this meeting about like academics is brutal especially in research right with our students it's not so bad right all they say is like he's a terrible professor don't ever take them right goodbye right but like your colleagues if they're saying wow that person like doesn't know anything they're a terrible writer like how do they ever get a job and hire like we're just brutal it's so hard when you get that feedback like hey your 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 proposal was triaged you suck we'll see you next year possibly if you're still in academics so I mean that's the way like I like interpret all that but just gotta go like it's about ideas, not about people. We're trying to fund the best ideas. We're trying to like spend our federal funds wisely. Like that's the lens you have to look at this through. And that's it. So I don't know if that was long enough, but um, okay. So let's let's have a conversation about how to do this well as a community and uh, how to interact with our our um, our, our funding agencies. Um, so I think when you ask a question, if you can, maybe I think you spoke, maybe speak into the microphone so it's captured on the video in case they want to, in case they want to talk. So yeah, please. Hey, name and affiliation since we don't know everyone here. Okay. Um, so I am Sarah Brant Rajan and I am faculty, first year faculty in the counseling program. Um, so my question is when you're actually writing the grant proposal, so you all mentioned um, having multiple folks from in a multidisciplinary um, team on the proposal. When you actually write the proposal, do you recommend everyone on your team? Um, joining in to write that or do you traditionally select like one person who may be like a stronger writer to write the proposal how do you all use generally yeah, do that you, you want me to do it yeah yeah okay yeah I got a couple things to say on that um, so I you know I'm the one that like song you can I'm willing to write 10 or 15 proposals a year we get 100% failure other people are not necessarily as motivated and are willing to spend most of you know your days and nights doing it so I, I would first like only pick people on your team that have a similar mindset like don't pick someone because they're in an area and they have expertise or something like that you got to pick someone that like gets your vision and is going to join you and if you if you say to someone hey um, I want to write this project I want to write you in and I'll do all the work w what has happened to me too often is there's no buy-in from everyone else because they don't have any stake they don't they don't have any like what is it dog they don't have a dog in the fight they're like yeah sure Sarah thing yeah please write me in I would need a course release every semester I will need travel money and I will need summer salary 
and here's my CV. Um, the problem is when if that's the way the relationship's set up, then then that's the way the way the relationship oftentimes goes afterwards. And then you can, and then you have the sub awardee, essentially your colleagues that were never really bought in, and now you've got to try to get them to do things. So I strongly recommend against that. Like get a team that like gels. Um, work on something else besides a grant proposal first to see how like how they work, right? You know, maybe plan like a course together or like do something kind of low stakes where you can kind of see like, does this person like do work after three o'clock in the afternoon? Do they think about work on the weekends? Will I see them during the break? What do they do in their summer, right? Because that's when the research happens here, right? It's not during between eight and five most of the time, right? Because all of our time is spent with office hours and faculty meetings and so. So that's, a little, that's I guess that's, uh, and strong writers, I mean, you gotta feel people out. I would, I would like kind of, review, hey, send me one of your papers, right? And you're like, wow, this is terrible writing. There's no way that I would, you know, have this person. Like, like vet them and then you then decide. So what I did was I tried to like pick all the like the senior faculty that were gonna evaluate me for tenure. Um, because I thought like if I partner with them, they'll think like I'm a good researcher, but they were like not good researchers. So like I wasn't a good partnership at all, right? So I, bad move. Um, so I went outside my university. So that's a long answer to a short question, but there's a lot to that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Sure. Sure. Oh, uh, okay. I see. Thank you. Um, I was hoping, uh, Dr. Rushton, that you could elaborate on Greg, please. If you could elaborate. I'm sorry. My name is Rebecca Oldham. I'm in the Human Sciences oh, yay. Department. Oh, to meet you. Yeah. This yeah. Super exciting. Yeah. Human Sciences. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. I'm hoping you could elaborate more on the part of your presentation where you talked about working with senior researchers and things that you could potentially yeah. bring to the table. Yeah. I want song that you're in here too. So. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you I'll give you some like stories of how I did it. I don't know if it, how relevant it'll be to you. So, um, like in your field, there might be like people that keep showing up in the literature as being like these are like the you know top people, right? They're the ones that have all the postdocs that get all the faculty positions, right? Like there's the senior aristocracy in each one of our fields, right? Um, so one way to, to get involved with them is to write a proposal with them, not maybe as a co-PI, but then you ask them to be on your external advisory board, right? So external advisory board is a super great way to stroke people's ego. Like, oh, you, you, you're so uh, experienced in this area. I don't know anything. I'm just starting, you know, can I give you $1,000 for four hours, you know, virtually and just ask your opinion, right? Smart professors love being told that they're smart and being able to give advice for money. It's awesome. So that's one great way, right? So like, I can't believe like I've got people from Stanford and like like really like not really. I know that's wrong. Um, like real like established research institutions, like top people that don't know me from Adam. And when you're like, hey, I'm writing this NSF pr proposal, here's the one pager, I can give you $1,500 for one day of work a year. Like people just, yeah, they're like, yeah, sure. You know, it's my 10th advisory board. Um, I don't have to go anywhere and I just have to show up on video. So that's a really, that's a good way. The other way is to see them at conferences, go to their talk, uh, or go to one of their postdocs talk or whatever, they'll usually be there. And then, and then ask a probing, interesting question, and then afterwards say, hopefully you know what they look like, say, hey, I've got this idea, I'm willing to do 95% of the work, um, I, w I just want you in this role. Um, you could be on an advisory board, or if you think there's enough in it, and it's interesting enough, would you or one of your colleagues be interested in being a co-PI? So that's another way to do it, right? Um, or you could do what I suggested as well, which is find a research project that they're on, large, collaborative, interdisciplinary, and say, hey, I'm interested in piloting this piece or doing this piece on or analyzing this for you. I've got some students, looks like you've got a lot of data in this area, I read this paper, do you have any more? And then you basically are joining their research team for free, right? You can prove that you're good at doing whatever they're interested in, 
offer to write a paper with them. That's great. And then, and then they're like, oh, yeah, I worked with Dr. Oldham. She's fantastic. She's super responsive, understands this field, like energetic, always smiles, wears great clothes. I'm in, you know? And then the next time, you know, that's how it goes. It's all about personalities, ego. I, that's what I think. You at? What do you? Oh, yeah, yeah I, I, I cannot agree more on that. Uh, yeah. So the uh, yeah, when I when I was started just about seven years ago, I'm I'm, I'm new in the game. So essentially, uh, particularly when when you're working with agricultural research and those land grant institutions, they are just dominating. They just wipe everything out. You know, it's really really hard to uh, knock on the door. Like I have an idea, I send an email to some faculty member, knock on the door. They probably more than likely you got <laughs> ninety percent of no's. You know, like ten yeah. percent of like go names. away. So it's really really hard to do. Uh, so that's one of the things I realized, perhaps, as uh, being a faculty member on campus, we spent time service, research, and teaching. We need to learn to uh, do a little bit more on networking, uh, marketing yourself a little bit better. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you, like, like what Dr. Russian was saying, that you go to uh, professional conferences, you might meet a very, like a superstar, you know, researcher from Cornell, you know, from yeah. any other institution. Yeah. Uh, it might be very hard for you to jump on and just start talking with them about research because, the, you know, the resources you have probably not going to be on the same scale, you know, doing things very very different. However, you can look at their lineage. There might be a, a short period of time you and him actually have a little bit overlap. Oh, yeah. You know, hey, I know you've been there working there for a while. You know, one of my colleagues happened to be there yeah, at the same yeah, time. Yeah. We're working on similar projects. Yeah. That really kind of helped bringing, you know, the distance a little bit yeah. closer. Yeah. So that way, when they, re they, they and then they started, you know, want to learn more about what you can do, uh, what kind of unique, you know, resources or skill sets you can bring that to the table. Yeah. So next time when you have a big program set up, said, oh, you know what, I, I heard that guy was over there and he probably can be part of that so uh, that's some of the things that you can uh, you know that will be really good and the uh, the other thing I I think I benefit a lot from some of my uh, very close uh, colleagues I've been working over the years so because uh, I did my postdoc at AM uh, and essentially that, that goes back to the, the previous questions about you know building a, a team or writing a grant proposal I typically I pick the person I, yeah. I have to be the person that I trust you know because yeah. writing grant proposals is a lot of work I mean that typically the people I'm looking at is I I send them the email I'm anticipating something bad within hours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If you if you have to wait more than a couple of days to get that's emails right. from you, that's like yeah. an automatic no. Yeah, not no, work. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and sometimes I call them on the weekends. They'll pick it up. <laughs> if they couldn't pick it up, they'll they'll, they'll let me know. <laughs> so yeah. It's, sometimes yeah. they'll be getting that. Yeah, that's, so good, anyway. that's a good way to test. <laughs> send an email during a break. Yeah. You know, send a text. You know, at, after afternoon. Yeah. See yeah. if they pick up. Yeah, that's, that's good. That's yeah, good. Yeah, it's, it's testing. So and then the uh, on, on the personal side, you want to you want to maintain your product activity you want to make sure you got a paper published you know and get yourself established and you know making sure because you, you know it's published or perish so they know you are producing you are working and then you know when opportunity comes up like that you probably your colleagues will introduce you to some of the people say hey he's, he's being very productive yeah. so if you got a big project coming up and you need publications to acknowledge your you know federal sponsors and they need to see this kind of thing so yeah he's productive he's good so you know like in every conversation, like I would think whether it's a federal sponsor or a colleague um, or a potential collaborator, like think about how how what you contribute adds value to what they care about. Mm -hmm. Like um, don't be don't be needy. Like don't like we all have so many demands on our time, right? Like if you look needy. Ugh, that's that's bad. It's bad, right? Because we we're already getting sucked dry by every single demand, right? So if you can look like, hey, I'm going to be a person in your social network that like makes your life better, it makes you feel like you're doing more of the work you want to do, and it's contributing to your agenda rather than like you have another mentee, another person that you have to like spend time with. Like the positioning in that conversation is really important. Go. Okay. Uh, Christy Julian, Human Sciences. You've both mentioned trust, value, contributions. Yeah. My question is, if you're coming and you're sharing your ideas, and you're saying, this is an idea I have, how do you protect yourself from... Yeah, I'm not worried about that at all. I don't have good enough ideas that people are like, oh, wow, I met this guy. I've never heard of him before. And he's like, he had this great idea. I'm going to write a grant proposal before you. Like, I, I'm not that good. I, I'm not worried about it. Um, but maybe you have proprietary information. Share it with Dr. Oldham. And if she says, like, you would win a Nobel Prize for this, like, <laughs> you know, then, then maybe you need to protect that. I just, I'm not worried about it. There's way too many ideas that people don't act on all the time. 
Okay. It's just not something I, it's not one of my filters. Like, oh, I have okay, this great so idea that no one's thought of. And most of the time, it's like someone thought of it 500 years ago and already published like 100 papers on it. So like, okay. uh, I, I'm just not that smart. <laughs> okay. so, it, was, it was mentioned with, um, with Jeff, um, um, Professor Porter, Director Porter. Director the, Porter. Director Porter. Call him, yeah. Okay, Jeff, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and he had said sometimes you have an idea and then next year you see that somebody else has submitted it. So that's why I asked the oh, question. Really? <laughs> I'm just saying. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That, no, that's never happened to me. Okay. Well, yeah. No, I, I, well, I, I, mean, you, I don't know. I don't know. Is human science is like a super cutthroat. Like everyone's like trying to steal everyone's ideas in the field. Like, no one cares about my ideas. I'm trying, I'm trying to get them to, to think my ideas are a little bit valuable, not the, not the other way around. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. I, don't know you, I don't know how your field works. Yeah. Okay. I guess that's, that's that, yeah, it is very discipline uh, dependent, I guess. Are you that's the. Yeah. about someone knowing what, like, your idea about grasses? <laughs> <laughs> that's well, a good point, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, to me, like, no, yeah, the, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 yeah, the majority of the work's already been done, like, yeah. this, like, I mean, this, you're looking at those land grant, they have their extension offices, yeah. you know, research stations here and there. Oh, they are pretty much doing everything that I can think of. So, from my uh, own perspective, I guess I really depending on the discipline that what's really get me up in the bed is really think of something that not a lot of people ever doing that before can you find it I guess yes uh, but the uh, to me it's always gonna be new problems and you know not not enough opposed to get them submitted so, <laughs> so that's the uh, to uh, to give it an idea as um, we uh, I think one of the, the, the best idea that we have before is like I have this collaborative work with the uh, the School of Medicine at Vanderbilt uh, so the uh, a lot of the the human medicine research that you like use mice, you know, and, and that's the, the classical work they're doing. Yeah. So I, I interact with a lot of professors over there. I said, well, why don't we use mice? Because the, uh, if you are working anything like a reproductive organ related with a human being, because all the mice were born before they reached puberty, so it's not appropriate. So can we use large animals? Like, yeah, I'm, I'm an agricultural person. We have beef cattle. Uh, and cattle? you guys, yeah, we have beef, beef cattle. Oh, wow. yeah, I mean, the, uh, right, for all my proposals are going to have cattle in them now. <laughs> <laughs> we can all your money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's perhaps one of the things that the uh, not a lot of people know that is the, uh, from uh, uh, the human human organ that fairly close to uh, large animals like swine and cattle, but not not a digestive system. So that there will be a lot of new ideas could be formalized. So I really I don't know. That's really de depending on the discipline. For yeah. me, I never ran <laughs> into that issue. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hi, my name is Rafael Tantpazi. I'm computer science, but I do it by informatics. Oh, hi. So I work with agriculture, uh -huh. with NIFA and uh, USDA. Uh -huh. And uh, I do computer science, and I collaborate with biology group. They are doing the, the biology. So how can I write a, uh, like, like a solo? It's, it's going to be tough for me to go with the biology, apply for uh, a grant. So I always work with the group, and they usually they come up with the idea or I get the idea, but like uh, they come with the idea, the biology parts, and they, they present that. So how you can like work on your own uh, somehow to because you are depend on the data they bring. They have to bring the data, which is they come from Virginia USDA and all that information. So you have to work with them, and they do the biology part, and I do only the data yeah. science part. So how is that could work? Because you work both ways. Look like you are from the biology went you to the computer both, science. Uh -huh. one of the so how is how is That's that would work? Uh, yeah, that, that that is very that is a very good question. So you, 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 the, the the larger picture of the question is like you're essentially saying how can you bring data sciences and biology right mm -hmm. together when you do only one of the pieces? Yeah. Okay. Oh my gosh, that's that's a, that's a, that's a hard question. From I guess my my background make me unique in a way I can say both sides of the story. But if you if you are working with somebody else, oh gosh, that that is a but good question. You start going to conferences that that where the the the, the yeah. subject like where you can apply your computer science to is what people are talking about, right? And 
but you can still depend uh, on the data. So you have that data has to come from the biology part to group. Okay. So agriculture. So this is. But where a lot of times the biology people the are like, I, I know how to study this, but I don't know how to analyze it. And yeah. right, I need. Is there anyone in computer science? Because we're so siloed. So yeah, you're bringing value to that whole community by by doing that. Maybe maybe you're not seen as. Uh, maybe you're seen as an asset to them, right? And they, they're seen as an asset to you because you can't produce the data, you can analyze it. So we're actually, uh, I'm part of the research committee. We're actually gonna talk about that exact question next month at our research breakfast. Make sure that you come to that if you can, um, where we talk about data science, right? Every, most of us are gonna have some interaction with data science in some shape or form, either doing the data, what's that? Yeah, yeah, it's in February. Um, the f uh, it's coming up here pretty soon. I think I, I, if anyone wants to send me an email, I think I've got the calendar um, set of schedule. But um, you're like super valuable um, to someone like me that comes from a, a science background, but not computer science background, right? We're gonna we're gonna generate data, and then I need to find people like you to actually do something useful with it, right? Visualize it, analyze it, set up databases. So um, I think you just need to find the people in the subject matter that you want to get the data from and then find the senior people that are good writers that are not mean that want to work with new people like you got to do the whole vetting mm -hmm. process of the relationship and then and then to say hey I, I have these skills it looks like you have these data it's like a Reese's peanut butter cup they just like they're like made to go together yeah. right yeah. And one, one, one question like most of the time if you are if you don't go with a co-bi or a, a bi that he has grants before and he yeah, yeah. They, they know before the, by the community it's tough to get a, a grant like this I, I believe yes yeah. yeah. absolutely so absolutely you have, that's where you, got you have to work with a group so it's not as is especially for you research new scientists so it'll be tough uh -huh. to work as a soul on this part so probably starting off you can you can uh, try to develop a collab close collaborative relationship with them first so because the uh, the one of the problem with the a lot of biologists the uh, either agriculture scientists or whatever they have a lot those people have data but when they have Hand those data to either statistician or data scientist, and they come up with a bunch of things they don't understand. So essentially, they instantaneously they feel that distance. Mm -hmm. So if you can work that slowly with them and try to break them down, that's like I says, here's a preliminary result, and I analyze that for you. Can we spend some time? We can yeah, communicate so this, a little bit better. What Song just said is really important. So the top dogs that are all funded, they generate more data than they can analyze. That's right. Yeah. They don't have enough people, so you can say, hey, I'm a new person in this field. Give me some data. You know, and I'll let me let me show you what I can do with my you know my nodes and my clusters and my you know CPUs and my GPUs. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me show you some skills, and then you make write a paper for them, or you make some presentation for them. If they like it. Yeah. Then they're like, hey, we can write you in this piece for the next thing. Yeah. And then you become equals, yeah. and then you yeah. become the lead. That's and how then, you. Yeah. And then it, it yeah. could work like that. Yeah, on the personal side, the uh, when I originally, when I initiated, initially started working with this, the, the school of medicine professors, and they are well funded, because yeah. they're from NIH. Like, I mean, they never ran out of money. Uh, so there are some PIs over there, they have like 27 employees, all soft money based. Uh, I knock on the doors, I was like, hey, I can work with you. They said, oh, sure. And then you probably won't anticipate any emails, any contact for, for many months. And then I probably, I send them an email, instead of saying that, hey, let's work together or whatever, right. I, I ask them, hey, do you have a lot of data that nobody ever try to process that for you. And then during that process, I learned that because they have so many, the um, uh, RNA sequencing data, and they typically just outsource that to some other companies or send them to India and analyze, and I said, oh, okay, go ahead and send it to me, I'm free. So, I'm free I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm free, I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm eager, English, you know. and I, I need a paper. So that's essentially what it is. And, and they sent it to me, I analyze those data, I send it back to them. So, and they said, wow, this is great. I, I, I didn't anticipate somebody like that can do this. And then I explained to them, oh, there's probably some of the biology that goes into they say now you gain our trust to some to a certain extent and then we started developing this relationship with some medical we never get that founded but at least you you know it's good experiences and the, you know we can work on more things so yeah that's a good question yeah it's very very good I'll stay after for a couple minutes I don't have anywhere to go except for home after this so um, otherwise thank you guys for coming yeah. Ron Chen thank you for the opportunity to work with you this yeah. past year and uh, oh yeah you got one more thing you answered the ones about the team. Um, Christy Julian, Human Sciences. Time frame. If you were all teaching, we have other responsibilities. 
I know that there's not one size fits all on this. Um, can you give, like some things are really, really fast paced. You have to be prepared for a very quick turnaround. Um, and I like the idea of you said, if they didn't respond to you really quickly, then that gives you an idea who, who they, how they would be as a partner. Um, for us, um, like you've all been well funded. Um, and we all have other things we do, of course. How, how much time do we need to be prepared to carve out? I mean... You're a captain member, right? Uh -huh. you, so you have some leverage, right? From this from this perspective, that like I mean, none of our chairs would say to our new faculty member, "We don't want you to be successful." You know, MTSU is moving towards a, like a more like kind of scholarship, research, creative activity model. Um, you even have startup packages for people. So use that to say, "Hey, you know, I keep hearing I went to the seminar. These old you know people um, said late career as um, apparently what I'm being called now um, said. You know, I need to start this. I need to takes a lot of time I have to plan it a lot um, you know can I can I teach one less course or can I teach two sections well so if you're in that situation where like as soon as I suggest something your head is shaking we need to have a longer conversation and you need to probably get into the office of research because you if you are already shaking your head if that conversation like I would need more time and I couldn't get it that's like that's a red flag to me like that needs to be worked out before you even come to this kind of thing. Because if people aren't going to give you time, then they can't have the expectation, and you can't have the expectation of yourself. We all have 24 hours in a day. Yeah, so we should probably talk. We should go have coffee, and let's hear what your situation is. Okay. I've heard it all, I'm pretty sure. And I, I know what generally is said, but okay. if uh, I will also say this, that um, we're no different um, in most ways um, than any new faculty. We all have limited time. We have lots of demands. You have to learn how to navigate. You have to know, learn how to say no appropriately so people feel like you have, like you're on their side, but you are trying to be protective. And there are ways to advocate for yourself and have agency in a conversation when you're a young faculty. And how to have that conversation appropriately so you get what you want without being seen as a jerk or a person that they don't want around um, is, a, is a skill in itself, but it's a skill you have to develop or else you're going to have all your time swallowed up and in five years, we will, we will be in not at any different spot than we're in now. So, oh yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. I can yeah. largely echo on that. Uh, yeah, when I when I when I was started here, I was on a standard. Uh, I think as a new faculty member, you got a one class release, so you're on a three three. Uh, I was on a four four. Yeah. <laughs> so, four, four. oh my, I was I was on a three three, in my first year. So uh, until I bring in uh, the the federal grant, so I got a more teaching release. So, uh, yeah, t that, that really comes down to. Uh, time management. Um, particularly when you're at the, 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 the junior stage, it's very hard to say no. I'm, my personality, I'm, I rarely say, say no to things. <laughs> you know, I guess that I take on a lot of things. Uh, that really comes down to, uh, to time management. Uh, I know that sounds bad. I'm not bad. I know that's recording, but I don't think my wife will look at it. Uh, you know, I, 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 my wife likes to go to the mall and shopping and you know, things like that. So when I was going with her, sometimes I think about the idea of the proposal. I said, wow, that probably can be improved. <laughs> Somewhere else. <laughs> Not like that anymore. <laughs> so yeah, I think, especially when you are writing proposals, I think you have to squeeze out a certain period of time on a daily basis. You know, that couldn't be too long. It like, couldn't be like 30 minutes or one hour, but you're gonna have to consult in doing that. And that's that's why I was telling, that was the way I was telling all my students. If you think it's a, the, the task is so big, you cannot you cannot conquer that. And divide and conquer, do a little bit of every day. That's why the time frame is very important. So you can also get in a support community, get it like, yeah. if Dr. Oldham is in a similar position as you and she has similar aspirations, then you guys get together and work regularly and navigate and then get with some other people that you feel like understand
understand your situation, can advocate for you, but also to provide you support. So you yep. invite me to coffee, and I'll listen to the heavy teaching load and all these demands, and then then we'll figure it out once you believe that I that I that I understand your situation. But yeah, and the other thing, just work uh, work with ORS, and they they publish those those monthly uh, the bulletin, those publication, and going through your emails. And when I got started, we don't have anything like that. <laughs> so yeah, yeah Mr. Porter is doing a great job, and we, we yeah we, when we got started, it's just like we are just start fishing. It's like you know, shooting in the dark. We don't we don't know what's what's available. What's uh, what are the things you will be you will have a much better chance of getting it. Yeah. Like what Doc, Dr. Rushner was mentioning about. Don't try to avoid those very competitive grant programs at the very oh, beginning. They're you know, just don't yeah, it's, don't do that. It's wasting all your time. And, and talk with ORS and they they are the one that helping. So uh, uh, yeah, that's some of the advice I can think yeah. of. Yeah. So, Great. Yeah. Thank you guys for your time. Thank you. Yeah. Stick around. Glad you got in here. Glad to meet you.